<laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so uh, now, Dr. Allen, you are uh, a co-host, and so oh, it's thank good you. to have you with us this morning. It's good to be here. Uh, I'm going to show up here in a minute with uh, on my video. Right now, I'm opening my lecture on another laptop so I can read it while I. Okay, we're going to we're going to open with a prayer. I'll open with our standard every week prayer, and then I invite you to offer whatever prayer you wish to use to uh, to to start your talk. We'll just we'll in at eleven o'clock, which is now. All right, we'll open with our, with our prayer. Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Ogunaktu, Sahaviryang Karavavai, Tejasvina Vaditamastu, Mavivishavahai, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. May the divine being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the divine being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om, peace, peace, peace. Peace be unto all suffering and joyous beings everywhere. So with that, Dr. Allen, thank you so very much for your willingness to offer us your wisdom this morning and your perspective on Howard Thurman. It sounds fascinating. So now I'm going to mute myself uh, so that we can, uh, we can go ahead with just you as the speaker. All right. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, I don't think you've been given an introduction to me, right? No? No, Dr. Allen, I did not give an introduction. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm happy to do it. I just want to have some idea of who I am. My name is Lloyd Allen. I teach church history and spiritual formation at the Mercer uh, McAfee School of Theology. All my students are master's level persons training for Christian ministry. Uh, I, have a, I have a real interest in spirituality and the spiritual life. My connection uh, uh, it to you most directly is through Elizabeth Yates. Uh, I'm looking to see, is, uh, uh, Elizabeth is here someplace. I saw her a while ago, I think, yes? Was she here? Okay. Um, yes, I believe she is, Dr. Allen. Uh, yeah, there she is. Uh, and she has been, ago. I've been talking about you, Elizabeth, while you were gone. Um, and Elizabeth is, uh, uh, is my, has been my yoga teacher. Uh, I have been, if, and she is also my friend uh, and uh, my spiritual friend in her practice and life, uh, a mentor to me uh, in the life of the Spirit. So uh, I'm glad to be with her people and my people uh, here at the Vedanta Center. And I've spoken to you once before, and I spoke on Thomas Merton, <clears throat> and who is a, a Catholic mystic of the 20th century. And today I intend to speak on uh, another Christian mystic, uh, this one, Howard Thurman. I chose Howard Thurman for two reasons. One is because I've been reading a little Howard Thurman lately, and so I, I decided I'd talk about what was fresh on my mind. And uh, second, because as a mystic and contemplative and a powerful social witness, Howard Thurman, I think, think uh, will reflect many of the values of your community uh, as well as values of my own uh, community and Christian tradition. So, <clears throat> and I'm not making a distinction there between I'm Christian and you aren't. 
I'm just saying that the Vedanta Center is not a local Christian congregation, which is where most of my uh, participation occurs in religious institutions. Uh, my wife Libby is on here. Uh, that's Alan L. there, the woman in the red. She's on the back porch. I'm up in the office because I'm working. Uh, <clears throat> but um, the, uh, we also have uh, pretty strong ties with the Muslim community in our uh, town. And, and so uh, this wider uh, connection or wider uh, experience of the life of the spirit is something that uh, that this particular figure that I'm speaking of today uh, offers uh, in a way that was ahead of his time and probably ahead of our time as well uh, to be honest now <clears throat> uh, I can't see everybody some of you uh, and I won't be able to see you but of those that I can see how many of you have Give me a thumbs up if you have heard of Howard Thurman. Thumbs up. Okay. Thumbs up if you have read something by Howard Thurman. Thumbs up if you have read something other than Jesus and the Disinherited about Howard Thurman. That's what he's known for when he is known. All right, uh, if you don't have any questions, and by the way, I believe that you can always uh, unmute your mic if you choose. Uh, I'm about to share and uh, sh uh, read my presentation to you on Howard Thurman. But before I read my presentation to you on Howard Thurman, I want you to hear a little Howard Thurman. And so I'm going to attempt to share <clears throat> Uh, about a four minute interview with Howard Thurman. And if you can't hear this, I need to know you can't hear it. So uh, I've got a group of you. I have Uma and Elizabeth and Kay Hunt. So when I get started, if you can't hear this, uh, let me know. Yes, Uma, you'll get your, you got your hand raised. Uma, did you have a question? You got to turn your mic on. You got to turn your mic on. Oh, I can hear you. I can hear very well. You can't hear me very well? Yeah, I this can hear. Oh, she can hear me very well. When yeah. I start this, I'm about to start this video. And when I start it, it uh, sometimes there's difficulty in getting the sound to play over the video. Here we go. Libby, let me know if you can't hear this, okay? He's in his 80s. He used to be dean of the chapel at Boston University. His name, Howard Thurman. Religious experience is dynamic. It's fluid, it's, it's uh, effervescent, it's yeasty, all, all these words. But the mind can't handle that. So it has to imprison the religious experience in some way, get it bottled up. Then when it gets quiet enough, it meaning the religious experience, then the mind draws a bead on it and extracts out of this ferment concepts, notions, dogmas, so that the religious experience will make sense to the mind. But meanwhile, the religious experience goes on experiencing. Therefore, whatever creed there is, whatever theology there is, it's always a little out of date. This is why I feel that once a religion is stated in terms of dogma, or intellections that I perhaps, then it can become the source of propaganda. It has something that it, a handle, it can, but 
as long as you, the experience is vital, the only way that it can spread is by contagion, not by instruction, not by addressing the mind, but something you catch as you catch the measles, for instance. That's what I mean. When you speak like this, are you at one with uh, people who would think this way in all traditions? You're not saying oh, yes. a Protestant thing. No, it's the nature of religious experience, it seems to me, whatever kind it is. One wall of his office is covered with citations, honorary degrees, awards, and in the middle is a faded photograph of his grandmother, who started life as a slave. He counts her first among those from whom he took his religious contagion. My, my grandmother, for instance, um, who was a young woman when the Civil War was fought, and who um, uh, therefore was a slave in North Florida, uh, had the responsibility for, for taking care of us. My father died when I was very small, seven years old, and my mother became the breadwinner. But my grandmother was the anchor person who held us. And whenever she observed that I was, the water was getting low in my well, you know, or, uh, or my sister's well, uh, she would tell us something out of her past. And, it was the same story always, and, and we waited for it. She said that when she was a young woman on this plantation, once a year, or maybe more frequent, I don't remember that detail, the, a slave minister, a, a minister who was a slave on a neighboring plantation, was permitted to have a religious service for the slaves. And always, it didn't matter what his subject was, he ended his sermon in the same way. She said he would stand and look at them and he would say, you are not slaves, you are not niggers, you are God's children. And, I, and when my grandmother would say this, we would all wait for that moment because a faraway look would come in our eyes, and, and just a slight stiffening of a spine. And there was a contagion which, which came to us as little children, that, uh, that the, the, the creator of existence also created me. And therefore, with that sort of backing, I could absorb all the violences of life. I chose that four minutes primarily because it was four minutes. There are a number of interviews and uh, presentations by Howard Thurman that you can find on YouTube. And I think that I thought that was y'all for it, but uh, it's not. It's another. I gotta go turn this off. Sorry. Uh, there are a, a large number of Howard Thurman interviews or speeches on YouTube. And I commend them to you. They'll be a hundred times better than anything I do in 30 or 40 minutes here today. But I'm hoping to at least uh, get you interested in discovering this great religious figure of the 20th century. Um, and Howard Thurman uh, is also, uh, has recently, there's been a, uh, a film of about an hour that is produced called Backs Against the Wall. Backs Against the Wall. Uh, it is, and it's showing currently on, uh, on uh, Georgia Public Television, GPB Broadcasting. Uh, you can look that up uh, on your own if you're interested. And it is a, it is a more uh, complete kind of introduction 
to Howard Thurman, which I am not trying to do today. I'm not trying today to do a complete introduction. So uh, if, if you don't have any questions of me yet, and I'll try to leave some time for questions at the end, uh, I'm going to begin my presentation. Uh, Uma, if you can, if you can see this screen, uh, give me a thumbs up. Can you see the picture of a tree? Yeah. Okay. This is my little seven slide slideshow of uh, this presentation. So, Howard Thurman, born 1889, died in 1981. He was one of the great religious figures of the 20th century. His contributions far too numerous to even begin to cover in the time that we have this morning. I'm going to only speak to one chapter of one book out of the more than 20 books that he wrote. So here's what we won't be doing. We won't be looking at how he brought together his Quaker mentor, Rufus Jones's Christian pacifism with the political nonviolence of Thurman's friend, Mahatma Gandhi, and then having figured out how they connect together, pass that on to his student, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who may have, whom you may know used such pacifism and nonviolence in a great social movement in America. No, we won't be, we won't be exploring that. And, and we won't be exploring Thurman's most famous text, his classic Jesus and the Disinherited, which by the way, Dr. King again studied during the Montgomery boycott about how to do what he was trying to do, how to say what he was trying to say. Jesus and the Disinherited is the book that first linked Jesus and Christianity to the black oppressed rather than the white oppressors in American society, and which stands as a precursor to the later rise of the black liberation theology, James Cone and others. So we won't have time to talk about that. We're not gonna have time to trace this Baptist minister. I'm a Baptist minister, that's why I throw in the word Baptist here. We, we won't have time to trace how this Baptist minister, Howard, Thurman's influence on religious education was so broad and deep. While he served at various times as a professor, a chaplain, and a dean at institutions such as Atlanta's Morehouse College and Spelman College, and also at Boston University and Howard University, and his interreligious pioneering in founding the Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples in San Francisco will only be mentioned in passing today. We don't have time for any of that. But we do have time to take a brief look at the wellspring of all that Howard Thurman accomplished. That wellspring was his mystical encounter with God through contemplative prayer. From his materially impoverished but faith-rich childhood in Daytona, Florida, to the end of his life, Howard Thurman found the God of his mother and grandmother, whose picture you just saw in the video. He found her God and his God everywhere. He wrote once of his times of prayer underneath a great oak on the Florida coastline. And here's an image of that oak. He wrote this about his times sitting at the base of that tree. 
He wrote, quote, eventually I discovered that the oak tree and I had a unique relationship. I could set my back against its trunk and feel the same peace that would come to me in my bed at night. I could reach down in the quiet places of my spirit, take out my bruises and my joys, unfold them and talk about them. I could talk aloud to the oak tree and know that I was understood. It too was part of my reality, like the woods, the night, and the pounding surf, my earliest companions, giving me space. That's in his book, With Head and Heart. And Howard Thurman's explanation of the nature of that God-soaked life is my subject today. I want to say before I go further that Howard Thurman was thoroughly and deeply Christian. He's an Orthodox Christian, but he had an orthodoxy that was expansive and open to the mystery of God in all places, all peoples, all creation. My goal this morning is to summarize the Christian mystic Howard Thurman's views of humanity's inward encounter with God and its effects on the outer life. My source is chapter one of Thurman's book, The Creative Encounter, An Interpretation of Religion and Social Witness. The content of, the, of that chapter and the three other chapters that comprise this little book was first delivered at the Merrick Lectures at Ohio Wesleyan University in March of 1954. Because of that, uh, you will notice non-inclusive language in the quotes I use. I want you to know I'm aware of gender inclusive language and I believe it necessary, important, right. But I'm going to let Thurman's quotes stand as they were written. He was a most inclusive person and would no doubt use gender inclusive language today if he were speaking today. So with that caveat, I'm going to move on now to my presentation about his understanding of the human divine encounter. He calls it religious experience. You heard in that little four minutes. He's, he's using the phrase when he talks about the human contact with the divine, the spiritual life, what today would probably be titled, would probably be labeled either mystical experience or spirituality. He calls religious experience. So that's, that's, what, that's what will be said uh, in his book and in much of this lecture. So, religious experience. Thurman begins this work with a definition of religious experience. He defines religious experience as an inward personal encounter between humanity and God. Inward personal encounter between humanity and God. Quote, the conscious and direct exposure of the individual to God, end quote. It is an example of what is often called mystical experience, a direct unmediated apprehension of divine reality. He writes, quote, the central fact in religious experience is the awareness of meeting God, end quote. The most important thing he says that it teaches us is that God is, 
end quote. He also says, quote, this is not an inference, but a disclosure. Perhaps I should say is not merely an inference, inference, but it is also a disclosure. So I'm going to read that sentence again. This is, these are his words. The most important thing that the encounter teaches us is that God is. This is not an inference, but a disclosure. Perhaps I should say it is not merely an inference, but it is also a disclosure, end quote. And he wrote these things from personal experience at the very deepest level. Thurman noted that to the individual, the human divine encounter seems to include all the meaning of one's life and beyond one's life. Includes all the meaning of one's life and beyond one's life. After all, encounter with God is encounter with existence itself, being itself, the life of life, the meaning of meaning itself, encounter with the all in all. Otherwise, it is not encounter with what Thurman or his Christian tradition meant by God. My ears heard in the opening prayer today, divine being. These things we can say of divine being. Now, in that encounter, where that meaning is uh, revealed, the individual does not come bringing a clean slate to this universally human experience. No individual brings a clean slate to this encounter. The individual self, the individual self, brings its particular history of experience, his or her, and also ways of interpreting that history. The individual brings a history of experience and ways of interpreting that history. These serve as one's tools to interpret the nature of the encounter itself. These individual particular experiences are also part of the totality of meaning that makes up one's life. Since these experiences, these particular individual experiences exist, they necessarily exist in God, for all that exists, exists in God. Thurman describes this individuality within universality as the individual coming, a favorite phrase of mine from him, as an individual coming, quote, always, quote, into the presence of God with the smell of life upon him. End quote. Here lies the paradox of the universal encompassing without extinguishing the particular and therefore giving a rise to a variety of interpretations of universal experience. In Christian life, Christian theology, it is the scandal that accompanies Jesus. The scandal of Jesus, the particular. Incarnating God, the universal in Christian traditions, affirmations. This understanding of the individual being encompassed but not extinguished by the universal was central to Thurman's interreligious dialogue with other faiths, which he also saw as experiencing the whole and interpreting it through the particular. In this chapter that I am summarizing today, he talks of meeting uh, with a Hindu scholar in India on a visit to India, and they spent about an hour, an hour and a half talking about their faiths. He said, when they got through, both of them were smiling, and they realized they were smiling because they realized that they hadn't really shared much about their individual faith. So they agreed to come back together 
and take another uh, shot at it. And what he's, and he uses that as an example of, uh, when we came back, we talked about what our differing interpretations, uh, where they came from and what they were pointing at, which was the universal that we both shared in our mystical experience. So this called, this called Thurman to be a Christian who affirmed the human divine encounter in all religions and all persons, in all humanity, in all creation. So, in spite of the variety of interpretations of religious experience, which the smell of man brings with us, one thing remains in all of them, according to Thurman. That one thing is the affirmation of direct exposure to ultimate meaning, so inclusive that all questions disappear in the moment of encounter. The individual in divine encounter comes into possession not of some new and additional knowledge or thing, but comes to a realization, a realization of something known all along, for we are part of that which we realize. This realization is a key word for Thurman at this point. Realization is what is new in the human divine encounter. The fragmentary image of God the individual brings to the encounter provides a, quote, toehold that God uses to communicate a larger realization. I don't think I have the word toehold up here yet. <clears throat> But toehold is T-O-E-H-O-L-D. Like a person climbing a rock face looks for a toehold. God uses the toehold as a point to begin to communicate a larger realization. Institutional religions, institutional religion, institutional religions have as one of their purposes the provision of such toeholds for their adherents. It is what you and I were taught about religion in whatever traditions we have experienced. Now, those toeholds inasmuch as they are true to the whole, W-H-O-L-E, inasmuch as they are true to the whole, that religion is good. And toeholds are necessary, says Thurman. One can't just leap up to God without them. We have to use toeholds to move forward. I would say, not, these are not Thurman's words, I doubt if this phrase was around at the time, but I would say that common phrase, I'm spiritual but I'm not religious, denies the human particularity. Just as idolatry of a tradition, we alone are right, denies God's universality. Both are true. Religious experience requires toeholds to get a place in the great mystery, while the mystery rises ever above them as they look for the next toehold. The human divine encounter, an individual religious experience, brings with it a confidence, Thurman says, a confidence, an assurance that beyond the self and the self's power, powers of comprehension lies a fullness of meaning. Those who've been in the, counter, in, in the encounter have a confidence, an assurance that there is meaning 
fullness of meaning that lies beyond their powers of comprehension. There is order to the universe, and this is an assurance we have. But it brings more than confidence that such a reality exists or has been glimpsed. It brings personal knowledge that such a metaphysical truth, that which we have confidence is, it brings personal knowledge that such a metaphysical truth has chosen to reveal itself to you, the individual, to me, Lloyd, to you, Uma, to you, Ms. Ayers. So, it brings personal knowledge like that that is the key to understanding the Methodist movement of John Wesley. John Wesley began awakening to this dimension of religious experience when a Moravian missionary over in Savannah, Georgia, asked him as Wesley was seeking spiritual consolation. The Moravian missionary asked him if he knew Christ as his savior. Wesley replied, of course, every Christian knows Christ is the savior of the world. The missionary responded, I didn't ask you if you knew he was the savior of the world. I ask if you knew him as your savior. And that set Wesley on a journey that culminated at a Bible study in London, where he writes, he felt his heart strangely warm. Thurman would say, this is true of religious experiences across all religions, if it is the deepest encounter with God. If revelation is beyond our ability to requisition, then that revelation requires a revealer, which Thurman says, these are Thurman's words, which Thurman says, some of us Christians call Christ and others call God. And then he goes on, to talk about other names and ways in other religious systems. So the question rises, how then might we seek this mystic encounter which he has described here? Thurman says or writes of two particular disciplines that can ready human spirits for the human divine encounter. Two disciplines that he says can ready the human spirit for human divine encounter. One of them is prayer and the other is suffering. He begins before he talks about prayer or suffering. He begins by making the point that involvement of the human will, human volition, is always active at some level in the human divine encounter. Even though that encounter is initiated from someone, somewhere, something beyond us, and even if that encounter comes as a surprise. In Jewish and Christian holy scripture, the story of Moses and the burning bush and Thurman says, a burning bush may appear at any time, but one must always be willing to turn aside to see it. Even if the turning aside rises from fear or conflict, sometimes the awe-inspiring draws us by its awefulness. What is certain? is that we cannot be drawn toward the light if we do not first look for the flame. 
and it is here and it is here that Howard Thurman presents his contemplative heart his prayer and suffering discipline he first notes that there are other types of prayer but he defines this prayer for encounter as quote the method by which the individual makes his way to the temple of quiet within his own spirit and the activity within its walls. He, he italicizes three words, and you can see it here on this slide. He italicizes it's a method. It's not the thing itself, it is a method by which the individual makes a way to the temple of quiet. I didn't do the italicis on quiet. Uh, within his own spirit, and then the activity once within its walls, the temple of quiet. He uses another term uh, that I find uh, very helpful for this kind of prayer. He calls this kind of prayer, quote, readying prayer. Here's that here, readying prayer on the slide. Readying prayer for well, that first part, the quiet part. It is contemplative prayer that readies the human spirit for the active prayer of communion. He defines it as the total experiencing, experience of quieting down to the extent that must not be separated from meditation. So he brings in the term meditation as not the whole of readying prayer, but as an essential aspect of it. So Thurman holds that this readying prayer of which he says meditation is a part to be of equal importance with the active encounter itself. They are inseparable, he thinks. So the first step in readying, he gives practical advice here. The first step in readying is to find a quiet place. He notes the great service religious institutions can render to quote, provide spells and plate spaces of quiet for the world weary men and women whose needs are so desperate. He does this in a paragraph in which he talks about the busyness of the people in 1954. You and I can smile at how much more busyness there is in the society we live in today. But I thought this a particularly significant quote about religious institutions providing a great service by uh, by creating spells and places of quiet for world weary women and men desperate for such things. For me, sounded like the Vedanta Center. Next, he writes, quote, one must turn inward away from the things in the mind that divide and scatter one's thoughts and spirit. So the first one is quiet space. That's external, that's outer world. The second one is inward, turning away from the mind that divides and scatters. And he suggests various ways of this inward centering. The quiet reading of scripture text, the creation of a mental clothesline to hang one's distractions upon. Using the imagination to enter sacred scenes from one's tradition. And even presenting one's particular anxiety or guilt before God as a readying point. 
That last one is where he recognizes that many people who are under great anxiety or feel great have trouble turning their minds away from that. So he says, use that as the place where you focus and invite God uh, in to calm the distraction. Anyway, in this process of such readying prayer, Thurman says one finds, quote, the initiative slips out of one's hands and into the hands of God. The self moves toward God, who in Christian tradition is a seeking God. That is, he thinks this quiet, outward and inward is often fruitful because God is already seeking the Spirit. In the divine human encounter, prepared by the surrenders involved in readying prayer, the individual self is stripped of what Thurman called the smell of man and stands naked and vulnerable before the other. Now the things stripped away are not thrown away, but they are laid aside like old garments and viewed with a fresh vision, seen for what they really are. Some of the newly realized self discards, even though it takes a long time. That is, the newly realized self discards some of the things, but keeps others, picks them back up, this time in right relationship to a new center of values. This realization, remember how important realization was, this realization of one's true center, says Thurman, quote, is often like giving birth to a new self. Mm -hmm. and again and again, individuals, quote, must be born, reborn, until at last there's nothing that remains between them and God. Hmm. A second discipline that Thurman presents as preparing one for human divine encounter is suffering. Our time prohibits any full explanation or discussion of his insights on this very difficult matter. But I will say that Thurman proposes that suffering like prayer may strip away the self's false pretensions about the competency of the self as pain demands the cessation of all other thought or purpose. Another action or uh, result of suffering may be that honest hostility to God results. And this honest hostility to God resulting from suffering may also reveal the futility of the ego's illusions of its self-importance and pride. For me, I thought of Job. Like Job, suffering may cause the insistence upon knowing. And this insistence upon knowing may, in the face of unanswerable suffering, yield to realization of God's presence as real and sufficient. Now, I close with a brief note on how Thurman extends the mystic center into the outer social witness. He says that when one encounters God, one is exposed to the universal vision of God's purposes, which is seen in total meaning. And though we can never fully comprehend the depths of God's fullness, he says, Thurman, we can put, quote, our little lives, our little thoughts, our little activities, our little devotions, end quote, at the disposal of the vision granted in encounter with God. And in doing so, we, quote, can achieve, in fact, what we see in vision. 
end quote. And gradually, we and our world become through contemplative mystic encounter and its embodiment in our lives, one with what God is bringing into being in all creation. That's the end for me. Uh, looks like we have about 10 minutes. Uh, I've gone, uh, I don't know how long you last. Uh, I was thinking till noon, you may have to go now. Uh, I know that if we were all at the Vedanta Center and the food were out there waiting, we'd be out of here, but not so. So, uh, you're welcome. You're welcome to continue the Q and A and commentary as long as you like, uh, Dr. Allen. This was this was uh, heart filling, and I'm sure there are many people who have something they would like to ask or say. So stay with us as long as you like and as like they like. Thank you. Does anyone, and you are, you are able to uh, unmute your mics in a way I am not. <clears throat> if you have any questions, it looks like you have to ask the host to unmute. I don't know, this is part of the new uh, Zoom. Normally we just speak up. Um, is, is anyone have a question for Dr. Allen? All their mics are closed. Okay, go ahead. Um. Uma, speak up. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you so, so, so much because personally I could go back about 30 years when I was at Emory uh, doing my PhD, I took a course called Holtness and Being by uh, late Dr. James Fowler. I'm yeah. sure you are familiar with him. Yeah. And um, in that course, he mentioned that Dr. Thurman visited India in 1934 and had a private session with Mahatma Gandhi. Yes. And that time he posed a question to Gandhiji that what does he think about the Negro? That time the word was Negro. So what does he think about the movement that is uh, right now going on in America about the Negro enlightenment. And that is the time that Gandhiji made a statement that it will be through the Negro community that emancipation will come. And those words are so prophetic. So that's what I wanted to share with you and second, what I enjoyed most deeply in your lecture is the comparison about the Vedantic view and Christian view about mystical experience. That more than the thought process is an intellectual approach, it is what counts is the personal encounter the deeply felt, as you said, it's a contagion. And when you're caught by that contagion, then everything else becomes either, you know, not that important. But that's what touched me deeply. And thank you. I, thank you. Uh, one of the quotes about that, it's not, I'm not going to quote, but one of the things that he said about that visit with Gandhi, yeah. Yeah. Was that Gandhi expressed disappointment mm. that the spiritual movement of nonviolence, which had been so effective in India, mm -hmm. uh, spread more widely uh, into the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And then, it, through the conversation you're describing, said, 
well, perhaps this nonviolent political activity that I have presented will be carried on yes. by the American Negro in their struggle for rights. And uh, it is not often enough stated mm -hmm. that it is Thurman who understood at a deep level yeah. uh, this spiritual power, who brought it back, and who had a whole generation of students, including Dr. King and others, yes. whom he taught uh, that Christianity and the nonviolent political movement of Gandhi uh, were not only compatible, mm -hmm. but they were part of the same cause. Yes, it was. A second thing I want to say in response to uh, your comments are, for most of my career, mm -hmm. teaching Christian students, Protestants in the South, I have had to struggle to get students to appreciate that some religion other than Christianity might have some truth in it. <laughs> or if they believed it had some truth in it, that they wouldn't assume that because other religions had some truth, when they got to the top of the mountain, they'd all be Christian. <laughs> yeah. Gandhi has a different way to talk about that. But here's what I want to say to you. What I just told that was a problem for me teaching, mm. it's not much of a problem for me teaching now with the progressive Baptist students that I have. Mm. The problem I have now is often that my progressive Baptist Christian students think Christianity is not necessary for their own lives and ministries, nor is Hinduism, nor is Islam. All of those are just shells about the real thing. So it's not true of all students, but for many of them, the culture in which they exist is that uh, that the particularity of religious traditions is unnecessary. Uh, and I think Thurman also has an antidote from that, for that, from 70 years ago. And I saw that in my, in my language about the toeholds. That uh, we can't move from nothing to something. Uh, and Elizabeth, uh, I, I remember you saying to me once that some advisor of yours, not, not me and not a Christian advisor, said, you know, Elizabeth, uh, to move forward, you need to go back to your Christian religion and understand it better. I don't know if you want to speak to that or not, but I think Thurman would agree. Uh, I can be a better universal human being, spiritual human being, if I understand my own tradition uh, fully and can lean into it in a way that doesn't cut me off from the next step up. Let me just say amen to that, uh, Dr. Allen, uh, from the perspective of someone who uh, is responsible for teaching at this place. Uh, the foundation of Christianity, a Methodism in which I grew up, uh, those who listen to me regularly know that uh, Christianity and the teachings of Christ are foundational to the way I think and the way that things are taught here. It's it, the toehold that, that, that that's yeah. such a beautiful uh, metaphor. Yeah. Uh, and the particularities mm -hmm. are important. This deconstruction um, that's going on, this idea of deconstruction is is uh, subversive. Thank you. Thank you. Where does Dr. Thurman touch you personally, Dr. Allen? Where does he, where does his where do his insights touch you personally? Um, I do not have the kind of immediate mystical experience in my life 
uh, as vividly as uh, Thurman does. But uh, I agree the former uh, abbot out at Holy Spirit Monastery, now deceased, uh, what was his name? Pennington? Who said, <clears throat> uh, not many of us reach this kind of mystical experience, but all of us can be changed by at least a partial understanding of it mm -hmm. and the desire for it. Yes. So he touches me because he comes from my tradition as a Baptist <laughs> and as a Protestant. And uh, he helps me understand that some of my former religious experiences which were very personal and very deep for me at nine or 10 years old. Uh. In our tradition's language, accepted Christ. He helps me connect it to a larger meaning, universal kind of meaning. One thing about Thurman. The other one is uh, today, race is still one of the great obstacles to spiritual unity and all unity in our country. We know that as we sit here this morning. Amen. Thurman is an African American mystic. Uh, and that is a powerful symbol uh, for me. And by the way, uh, I'd heard of him before. I came to begin to read him and think about him more when an African American woman in Atlanta whose name is Loretta Brown, uh, who is a Thurman expert and a spiritual director. Uh, I, the phrase I remember is, she said, I searched so long for a model for me as I longed for contemplative life, but all I saw were white faces. Mm. I met Howard Thurman's in history. And she said, and I knew it was for me to. Uh, so on, in my outward experience, Howard Thurman uh, is a face that I can lift up to my African-American students and to all African-American Christians, even though I'm white male. And I can say, uh, uh, we share. We share a depth and a meaning in mystical experience. And here's a guy who can... Uh, articulated for all of us, for all of humanity. It's just a, he's just a super guy. <laughs> uh, and by the way, it's part of the particularities that uh, so few people know him. Now he's widely known, but nothing like uh, Thomas Merton, nothing like Mother Teresa. That's not an accident. Exactly. And we're all humble in the presence of true saints. Yeah, he is one of those. If you just read him, uh, he is so deep, but so simple. I know when I was in seminary, there was this great theologian that my theology professor had written his dissertation on. So our theology professor uh, was teaching us about this great theologian, this great German theologian. I didn't get it. But then he made us read the book, and I thought, well, why didn't he just say that? <laughs> recognize I'm doing that today. I'm trying to summarize uh, something that he says so much clearer. Uh, to read him is a joy. Yes. By the way, Uma, to read Fowler is not that much of a joy. <laughs> Great. But he's, you know, he never uses a five-cent word when he can use a 50-cent word. That's not true. <laughs> Thurman's not going to say uh, spirituality. He's going to say religious experience. <clears throat> great teacher. He yeah, great teacher. Great teacher. Both of them are great teachers. Were great teachers. Lloyd. Lloyd. Yes. Hi. Um, I'd like to point out to folks that there's a. I haven't been to it myself, but there's a website that has digitized 
Howard Thurman's sermons, talks, and lectures. Mm. And you can access it just by Googling Howard Thurman virtual listening room. Mm. I've been meaning to get to it and I just haven't yet, but mm. I just want people to know that. So it's the Howard Thurman virtual listening room. Okay. Just Google that. I'm so glad I didn't know about that before I presented this because then I've had that much more material. <laughs> Frustrated, I wasn't. Leaving, I was leaving out. Uh, thank you, Howard Thurman Listening Room. Virtual listening room. Virtual listening room. Okay, uh, thank you. Unlike many figures, he was such a public figure that there are many of his uh, videos mm -hmm. out there and available, or audio. And as you could see from the four minutes, uh, sometimes when you're in the presence of someone like that. Uh, more than just his words mm -hmm. to you. Uh, his hands convey stuff when he's speaking to us. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's the meaning of contagion, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Laurie. Dr. Adam? Yes. So much enjoyed and so much related uh, to whatever you talk, we are talking the same language. I've been thinking about why this difference. One difference is because of the technicality of the terms and the technicality of the language. Yeah. For example, science is science. Yeah. Six, a physicist, even when he's from Japan, he will talk in Japanese, but he will talk the same language. <laughs> the same way about someone from Australia, someone from India. So they're talking different language, but the same substance. Yeah. And the same thing is, that's why to me, religion is a science. Yeah. Uh, they might come from any area of the world, but they will talk about the same thing. Yeah. And that is the point, for example, what you said brought to me a classic meeting between Kabir who was partly Muslim, partly Hindu philosopher, and he was meeting a mullah who was a great scholar of Islam. And when they were going to meet, people from all over came just to listen that what they are going to say. So there was a small tent. Kabir went there, mullah came there, and they said, now for hours and hours, the discussion will go on what is God. Within 10 seconds, both of them came out. <laughs> very happy, very appeased, very content. I said, what did you talk? He said, not much. No, 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 what did you talk? He says, he asked me, have you seen God? And I said, yes. And I asked him, have you seen God? He says, yes. <laughs> and they're both so content. <laughs> Many times, this goes like an electrical connection. It does not need a lot of prolongation. It needs an instant realization. Mm -hmm. And that instant realization, whatever language, whatever is the religion, they will talk about the same thing. But I can also relate to the problem that you encounter in teaching the people of the modern generation because they are disbelievers. When you say mystic, to me, mystic is a scientist who sees proofs from beyond the five senses. Yeah. Because the science nowadays, no matter what science it is, it teaches you to believe through five senses. A mystic goes to, to the sixth sense, so he still is a scientist. Mm. But we will not accept it. So these are some of the things which need to be clarified for which are coming together like that. And then we a joint conference is perhaps the best way to come to that conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, said I, I said I didn't have time to talk about that Church of All Nations. Uh, back in the 40s and 50s, mm -hmm. uh, is creating a church for all religions to come to. It is not a non-religious or our religious. Uh, each one brings their own tradition uh, and, and strives to be deeply rooted in it, but they all come to worship together. Uh, and he's way ahead of his time in that. 
Yes. We had a Baptist from uh, Georgia, not this Georgia, the Georgia that was part of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. to visit us in which religion was persecuted. They have uh, built a new church mm -hmm. in which uh, one sec section of the church, Muslims worship in, and another section of the church, Jews worship in, mm -hmm. and a third section of the church, Baptists work in, and in a fourth session of the church, section of the church, Baptists uh, worship in, mm -hmm. and they are one congregation. And he says, and one of the things that we did uh, when we built it was that we agreed we would not, uh, that we would not all pooled together our funds to build these different sections, that the Baptists would build the Muslim church, and the Muslims would build the Baptist church. How lovely. Now, uh, I think that is a kind of uh, hopeful sign of what uh, Herman was talking about, uh, which is you have to have a door to come through. But the door is not where you're going. Mm. It's to come through. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Vivekananda said, it's good to be born in a church, but it is not good to die in one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, Uma Fowler yeah. uses, a, you know, Fowler's so famous for his stages of faith. Yes. And I thought I replied to my book on Gandhi. I the, fi the final stage of faith that he discusses is six, yeah. which that is often unrecognizable to the rest of the faithful, mm -hmm. because they still hold, still are at home in their in their tradition. Yes, but they are no longer in their tradition. And he mentions Martin Luther King. Yeah, and Gandhi. Gandhi. As two of those persons. And I think when I read Thurman, I think Thurman fits in there mm. as well. Maybe. Dr. Allen, can I ask a question? Yes. This is Keith. Um, and toward the end of the presentation, it seemed that Thurman was mentioning reincarnation. Did oh, I read that? Before? Rebirth and rebirth. Yeah, was, was, that, was that a spiritual or was that reincarnation? Uh, I think it is a, it's not reincarnation because it, as he would understand reincarnation, or at least as I understand it, that would be a life after this life, another physical embodiment. And when he's talking about these many rebirths, he is talking about the same physical embodiment being transformed and transformed and transformed in this life. I thought so, a spiritual rebirth, essentially. Well, I, I've dodged the word spiritual rebirth because that spiritual rebirth also uh, transforms ah. the connection in community. Uh, so it, it has physical uh, connections, in, entanglements. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Well, Dr. Allen, as before, when you were here with us physically, uh, this has been heartwarming, illuminating, uplifting, all the things that it should be. So thank you. And do you wish to close with a prayer? Uh, we have one that I'll, I'll end with. Please. But no, no, if you have something, please offer that, and then I'll go ahead. I was not prepared. Okay. <laughs> then, we'll, then we'll just do this. All right. Let there be peace in outer space. Let there be peace in outer space. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth, and in the waters. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth, and in the waters. Let there be peace in the herbs, the plants, and the trees. Let there be peace in the herbs, the plants, and the trees. May the gods be peaceful. May the gods be peaceful. May the whole universe be pervaded by peace. 
Let this infinite universal peace prevail throughout my being. Let this infinite universal peace prevail throughout my being. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all suffering and joyous beings everywhere. So again, Dr. Allen, until next time, uh, thank you uh, and thank you for being who can do something like this. This is, uh, it's rare and uh, your presentation of Thurman was sweet, sweet. It's as you as you knew, it would uh, be very, uh, very well received here. Thank you. And uh, next time we meet in the kitchen. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Lloyd. We appreciate it so much. That was wonderful. You're welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. All Thank right. You Great. Thanks. If there's nothing more, then we'll say goodbye uh, and end the meeting. So, Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai, Durga, Durga, Durga. Go in Mother's loving and protective embrace. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you for the chance. welcome.